And good afternoon. Oh, look. Yeah. There we are. I bashed my console at some point this morning. <laughs> my camera's pointing in the wrong direction. Ah, there we go. Good afternoon. It is Saturday. It's time for Retro Fun and Games 8 bit style. Yes, it is. It is. It is indeed. <laughs> Commander Ariok with. <laughs> now, there was a time. Now, you can try this. If you have a ZX Spectrum, <laughs> I've done this. I've done this. Um, if you can um, hum, right, into a ZX Spectrum, uh, if you attach a microphone to the mic port on the Spectrum, type load ditto ditto and put it into the loading mode and then go, then you can make the bars appear. <laughs> so try it. It does work. You can't make it come up with anything meaningful. If you go, if you literally put a microphone in the back of the spectrum and you go like that, the bars, the loading bars will appear. <laughs> I have tried it, it is true. So there's a thing for you to try. Okay, have I been at the least in evil news? Yes, definitely. Ah <laughs> oh dear, there we go. Right, so afternoon everybody. Uh, how are we all doing? Hello, um, who we got? We got Kelvin Ed, Ariok. Game okay, Infinite Flight, Kelly Bagla, Eggs to Bacon, all sorts of people. Awesome. Commander Sinclair is here as well. Frank Miner, Alexander, never mind. Good name. <laughs> Johnny Ock is here. Um, teasing the specky. Yeah, because you can't, you can't actually. You know the bit where it goes. Doo, doo, that bit. You can't. You can't. <laughs> I wasn't able to put any data into that and make it come up with some words. No, that, that didn't work. Uh, but I was able to trigger the, the bars that um, precede the data. <laughs> It's obviously, I don't know, it's some sort of tuning tuning noise, isn't it? it tells the spectrum something's coming. So that was quite funny. <laughs> it is possible. Um, anyway, we're <laughs> here to play some Elite, aren't we? So let's let's do that. Um, arr, open, right? Let's go and find... Where, where, where were we? Let's try and establish where we'd got to. So we were in Galaxy 2. All right, let me get the specy on the screen. That was with talking about nonsense are we um this is the original elite yes so uh, so you haven't seen it before legion where have you been we've been playing this for weeks now <laughs> this is the original elite this is the original elite this is not on the original platform i hasten to add this is on the zx spectrum which was the computer i had when i was well about the same height as i am now actually but um um yeah <laughs> slightly larger far less hair much much grayer but there you go. other than that pretty much the same <laughs> this is the original elite so we are looking here at the actually the short range scanner uh, let's have a look at the. Where are we now? I'll do that. Uh, this is this is this is who we are. We are Commander Jameson, which we learnt about actually on the law tour on um, uh, on Thursday. Who Commander Jameson was. So there's lots of law that actually connects this game to Elite Dangerous, which we've we've gone through many times. Um, we are currently a fugitive. We're bad. Okay, <laughs> we're on the run, <laughs> and our rating is competent after. Uh, after several hours of playing, I think we're about the eight hour mark in the game at this point in time, and we have a reasonable ship, we have a reasonable uh, amount of equipment on board, and uh, a bit of cash, a bit of, well, a bit of cash. Actually, for the Spectrum version, that's not a vast amount of cash, but it's enough to be getting on with most of the things that we need to be getting on with. Um, yeah, I hope we don't crash this time. <laughs> I'll do my best, I will do my best. Um, yeah, so Frank Mother says if you have a good memory and you're pitch perfect, you don't need a tape. Yeah, strictly speaking, you ought to be able to, whether you can modulate your voice fast enough to generate some data on the spectrum, I don't know. Um, R tape loading error would, if you could generate an R tape loading error, I think you'd be doing quite well back from the top of the voice. And remember to save, yes. So we are attempting, what we're attempting to do here, um, Legion 4, uh, is to trigger the missions in the ZX Spectrum version of the game. Now, we believe there are three. Um, we've got the what we think are the prerequisites for the first mission now. We're just waiting for it to trigger, but we're not quite sure exactly how and when it's going to trigger. Uh, we're trying to capture that on film, and we're doing sort of 80s nostalgia along the way. So, uh, not only have I got the original 8-bit version of the game, I have my I have my trusty Akai keyboard just in case. You know, we need to <laughs> we need to do anything 80s. Um, it's all it's all it's all set. So so chip in with anything eighties nostalgia that we go. Now our our plan is <laughs> our plan is to keep flying around and see if we can trigger the mission the missions. Um, now I uh, Commander Ariok, I think I saw him on the chat. So I believe 
Um, we've we've had some thoughts about what actually triggers the supernova mission. Now, we had flown down. We arrived in Galaxy Chart Two up up in here, um, and we've moved our way down to here. Uh, and we weren't sure whether it was distance, i.e. number of hyperspace jumps from the entrance point in Galactic 2 that, uh, that triggers the mission, or whether it's the number of kills. Um, so uh, we're not sure. <laughs> so we're sort of doing a bit of both. Now my plan today was to sort of head west um, across here. So we kind of need to follow this train of stars here. Head west and see if we can um, pick up the... Uh, pick up the uh, we just get this mission to trigger. We're not sure if it's number of kills or hyperspace jumps and I'm getting I'm getting rumbles of thunder outside again So if my stream this happened to me on Thursday if my stream suddenly goes offline because of a glitch on the power I will come back, but just just be my about take me about five minutes. It is it's just gone really dark outside <laughs> And I've just heard a rumble of thunder so Fingers crossed we won't get a power glitch. Um, but there we go. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so um, maybe we'll f maybe we'll find Raxler. Dum -bum -bum, who knows? I doubt it. Um, you can pick up the BBC version from the Frontier website. So, yes, if you want to experience the original Elite on the original platform, kind of, via an emulator on your PC, you can pick that up from the Frontier store. It's free. Oh, there comes the thunder. Can you hear that on the stream? I actually like thunder. <laughs> I've never been streaming in a thunderstorm before. This is a new experience. <laughs> um, ooh, yeah. So we'll see what happens. Um, so yes, Paul Watson, it does have the emulator. It has everything you need to run the original game, and it's kind of licensed to be able to run it. Now, there are a few gotchas. Um, if you download it, you have to put the emulator, I believe, into 100 to um, BBC B1... No, not BBC, B, BBC Master... 128 mode for it to run elite for some reason I don't know why I don't know much about BBC's actually to be honest so um, bear that in mind if you're playing it if you run it in normal BBC B mode which is what you would expect it doesn't work um, so yeah, got to be a supernova after that massive clap of thunder <laughs> uh, so anyway we are uh, we, we will do our best if, if I occasionally go offline or there's lots of static or there's a there's a flash of lightning or something then um, I can see a tree now outside my house blowing back and forth so it's, it's all quite ominous uh, but we'll do our best right so we are going to go across to right let's go across to Vezi Veziadi there we go I don't know how you pronounce some of these places we're going to launch out of, the, out of the space station there we go um, it's actually now it's really chucky it down with rain outside. <laughs> yeah, all that we left of me is just a smoking hat. <laughs> Here comes the rain. Oh, we've got hail. It's all happening. It's all happening outside. I wish I had a webcam. Hang on a minute. I have. Hang on a minute. Let me just stop the game here a moment. I'm gonna just gonna pick up my webcam because it's, it's this is this is looking quite good out there now. This is long enough to even look outside. I don't know if you can if you can see that. <laughs> It's absolutely hammering it down outside now. <laughs> it's, 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 oh dear. I'm glad I'm not outside. That's, that's actually hail coming down. I don't know if you can see that on the camera. Let me put it on, put it on full screen. Hang on, there we go. Bit to camera focus, there we go. <laughs> it's absolutely, it's just, it looks like, it looks like snow. That's insane. That is quite insane. <laughs> oh dear. Well, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me let me fix. There we go. We're back. Right, let me get my camera sorted out. There we go. Uh, spe spectrum. <laughs> Spring weather in the UK. <laughs> Where am I? I'm in the UK. Yes, this is Kent. Uh, so um, yeah, southeast Kent, quite near the sea. So <laughs> that's what all that was. Uh, and now I've just sort of knackered my camera. I've realised. Never mind. We'll get there. We'll get there. The green screen isn't quite. Oh, there's the thunder again. So I've got proper weather here today. <laughs> so apologies for any kind of flashes of lightning and crashes and bangs in the background. Um, there's nothing I can do about that. Ah, uh, dear. All good. Right. Let's let's get on with playing the game, shall we? Um, thunder and lightning, very very frightening, etc. Uh, hyperspace. All right. Off we go. Now we are trying to get this message, 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 yeah, mission to trigger, but we don't know exactly what the trigger is. Um, all we know is that uh, we have to be competent, which we are, 
Uh, we know we've had 256 kills because we got a right on commander last week. <laughs> oh dear. Um, that's quite distracting, actually, having that smashing down outside. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so we, we need to be competent. We have to be in Galactic Chart 2 at least. Okay, we, it won't trigger in Galactic Chart 1. So, in the original Elite, Galactic Chart 1 is kind of your training ground. Um, you know, so nothing too bad happens in Galactic Chart 1, but Galactic Chart 2, it starts it starts chucking more stuff at you, which is kind of fair. Um, and so we need to be Galactic Chart 2, we need to be competent, and we then, we need to have a Galactic Hyperspace, a Galactic Hyperspace Drive on the ship, which we have. So we've got all the prereqs, but we now we think there's a there's either a distance or a number of kills thing that we need to achieve. So that's kind of the objective. We're going to keep pushing on through the game until until such time as hopefully the mission triggers. So, uh, so that's 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 the aim. Um, now we are. Um, what are we carrying? Are we carrying? We're not carrying any cargo. So, um, because I'm a fugitive, I'm on a murdering spree. So what I'm going to do is actually. Oh, there's lightning. And thunder. It's right on top of us. I think this storm. So there we go. I'm actually going to pick these up because these are these are allies. So I'm actually trying to improve my kill count and travel distances because both of them may be mission triggers. <laughs> we don't know what the this is the problem. It, we don't know what trigger exactly what conditions trigger the mission. Uh, nobody's ever documented it. So it's a case of blasting and all right, there's some pirates, blasting and uh, and carrying on through the game as best we can. Um, right, so Commander Ariok thinks, oh, you were wrong in saying the missions were distance triggers. Okay. So we think it's kills. So we've been traveling a little bit of a distance. Oh, this guy's quite good. Sidewinder. So I'm just going to keep... Um, presuming it's a kill count, and then Commander Ariok, can you remember, does the mission trigger as you hyperspace into a system? Is that how it works, or, is it, or when you reach a space station? Is it, which, which way round is it? Got him. Oh, that was a sidewinder. So I'm just going, I'm just going to be a murder hobo, basically. <laughs> and travel around a bit. More lightning. Python. So I actually really like thunderstorms. I like sitting out, well not sitting out in them, but watching them from the window. Um, oh, I've overheated my weapons. There we go. Right, pick up the cargo. Oh, another pirate. This game's pretty unrelenting at this stage. Oh, this one's this one's nasty. He's got a beam laser. Debris from a another ship. So this is actually quite a. What sort of system did we fly into here? Was it? A, it's an anarchy system. So this is actually bad news. This is this is a system where basically you'll just keep getting attacked forever. <laughs> okay, it's jumps as you enter the system. Okay, so I need to hyperspace jump. Okay, well that's good. So uh, let's let's fly around a little bit. Let's pick up some cargo because it gives us some ill-gotten gains. Um, this is an anarchy system. So basically wherever I fly. I should get attacked. <laughs> These are systems you do not come into unless you've got a decent ship because you will die. Um, and the star will be ready. I do remember that, Commander Eric. I remember seeing that once before. Um, I'm pretty sure... I mean, I did play this game. I remember the Supernova mission um, when I played it back in the day. And I also remember the, uh, the Asp one, um, whereby you... You know, you have a, a, a weird cloaked asp, which when you kill it, it gives you a cloaking device. Um, but I never got the last mission, which is supposedly a Thargoid invasion, which sounds actually quite cool. Um, so this is an innocent ship, but I'm going to murder it anyway, because it's in my way. And I want its cargo. So I'm, I'm, I really am being a bad boy, but I, I, I want to get up. On the Inbell's wed. Okay, so... That implies I need a lot more kills because I've only relatively recently got the. So maybe that's 500 kills. Okay, so I've got 200 and 
I get a, I get a right on commander every 256 kills, which we did achieve last week. The next right on commander, therefore, should be at 512 kills. So maybe, maybe that's the trigger. In which case, I've got quite a long way to go. <laughs> so I'm just let's spend today murdering stuff. <laughs> um, and see if we can get that kill count up. That's that's kind of what we need to do. Get some alloys. There we go. So I've got a fuel scoop on board, which allows me to pick up cargo. I'm heading for the sun because then I can refuel without going near the space stations. But because I'm murdering everything, the space station may not let me in. <laughs> um, <laughs> someone's doing Buck Rogers. Um, awesome. Yes, we a couple of weeks ago we kind of went through a kind of space themes that Drew can vaguely play on his keyboard. Oh, rats! I shot the cargo. That's the only problem with this is sometimes the beam, the military laser, doesn't cut off quite quickly enough, and you incinerate the cargo as well as the ship, which is a bit unfortunate. Um, this is probably a sidewinder. Oh no, it's a crate. This is a crate mark one, by the way. So if you're familiar with the crate in Elite Dangerous, that's a crate mark two. Or well, there's obviously the Phantom version. Uh, this is a crate mark one that we're seeing in the original game, and it is quite a weak ship relatively compared to the Cobra Mark III. So the, the crate that we see in the game is actually a much chunkier version of the original design. This is a bounty hunter. This will be a. This will be a. Um, Bird lance, but not anymore. <laughs> okay, I'm just picking up debris here. This is alloys from the ship. Now, alloys are actually worth picking up because they're actually sort of 45 credits each. It's worth having them. Oh, that's another ship. So, as you can see, basically every ship I encounter is either a pirate, pretty much. Oh, I've got to be a bit careful here. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta be careful doing that. Oh, I hate this game sometimes. Let's try that again, right? I need to be more careful. <laughs> Die on the stream straight away. What ship in the current game would be most similar to uh Crate Mark 1? Probably, well, no, no, you can't say the adder because the adder exists as well. Uh, probably something like a DBX or something like that. I don't know. Oh, three pirates. Right. I'm going to have to be careful now because we need to get this kill count up and I need not to die. <laughs> I need to save position every so often as well. Um, Two crates. Nice. Oh, I hate it when I shoot the cargo. Because I take my there's a, I think it's basically the spectrum slightly struggling with the frame rate. Um, and um, you take your finger off the, the fire button, and the, the laser fires one more time. <laughs> and of course, if you're aiming at where the ship was, you're very likely to be aiming at where the cargo was. Jump there, by like that. It's really annoying. Um, let's turn around and head for the sun. There we go. So that'll be plenty of... So this is an anarchy system. Now, the, the, the way that the original game scaled its difficulty is that basically the, the political structure of the system... Oh, there's two ships behind me. Be careful of that. Let's see if I can get this guy first. Uh, the political structure of the system was such that um, you know, depending on the political stability, basically, is how many enemies you've got. These guys hit hard now. So you can see, even for a quite a well-equipped ship, my ship is still getting hammered. 
quite hard. <laughs> I'm going to wait here while this other ship comes in. Wait for my energy banks to recharge before I try to take him on. Oh, there we go. Right, once he starts firing. Oh, oh it's got me already. I've got up my skills here. I need to run away. <laughs> so what's quite nice is this is the game is still killing me. <laughs> it's actually quite hard now. Um... I need to I need to make sure we we pull away from the incoming ships. Um are not going to get anywhere. Uh that's twice I've died like in like 20 minutes. <laughs> ah dear. Uh do you get ranked for shooting the barrels? No, you <laughs> it's not going well so far at all. This is this is embarrassingly bad actually. All right, so we need I need to watch my energy. So this is what I mean this is good. I mean I'm a you know, I'm an ex experienced elite play would you believe um, and um, the game's killed me twice in 20 minutes with a decent ship so this is the danger of anarchy systems it was this game was very well balanced actually in the sense that um, you had to pay attention to you know the situational awareness was really important because even with a good ship as you can see if you get overwhelmed you can be killed. There's, you know, if you've ventured into an anarchy system like I have, you have to be prepared to be attacked basically constantly, and you have to allow your ship to recharge in between sorties. And sometimes the game will just chuck another opponent at you. And like no, now, actually, I think that's a innocent ship, but let's go murder it anyway. Um, Shooting's awful. I think the thunderstorm has now moved on. Oh, this one is launching. That was actually an anaconda or a rock comet. And those crates are pretty lightweight, which is nice. There we go. Let's pick up some cargo. So I'm a pirate in a pirate infested system. Computer's nice. Two tons of computers. Right, I'm going to try and stay alive this time. <laughs> That's an escape pod, which I can pick up and sell as slaves, which is very immoral, but all good fun. Uh, and now I need to find the star again, because I can't see it. Now I can, all right, well, the other thing that's a good safety device here is to have a hyperspace lock on a nearby system, just in case. I can't find the star, no, there it is. All right. The compass doesn't always have, now look at this, I've been bracketed by three, at least three ships. So the, the way to get out of this one is to fly towards one at full volume. Right, there's two behind me, so I've got four ships on me at this point. Um, they could easily be quite well equipped, so I've got to keep my distance and take them down one at a time as much as possible. Right, that's a sidewinder, so that should be. That's a missile. Right. Let's take this one now. Keep the throttle at full and try and get this one before the other two get into range, which is not going to happen. Uh, dicey situation. I've got to now concentrate. Once you've picked a target, you've got to stay with it in this game. Got it. All right. Now pull around, get these two, fly at them. Ah, energy low already. Oh. <laughs> I think maybe we should try. Try and avoid it, Anarchy says, this game is hard at this level. Um, ah, right, okay. Um, I'm gonna rethink my strategy here. I need to, <laughs> Anarchy systems are just too dangerous. Uh, that's a corporate state, so let's go there. That'll be safe. <laughs> dear oh dear, dear oh dear. Now I used to, in my youth, be able to cope with that. Um, but it's obviously, as a, as a nearly 50 year old, <laughs> it's obviously beyond me. Um, uh, never mind. So let's let's just be a murder hobo in a normal place. So yeah, yeah, run away is what I'm doing. Let's let's get to the planet. There we go. All right, that was easy, wasn't it? Because um, <laughs> we need to get the kill count up. We think in order to do this, and that's that's my objective, right? I need some fuel. Um, I can't add anything. Well, I suppose I could buy an energy bomb. Does anyone remember what the key for the energy bomb is? Yeah, when that third bank gets low, it looks like it's time to jump out. That's pretty much it. Let's buy an energy bomb, because that might be fun, just in case. Does anyone know what the key is for the <laughs> energy bomb on the Spectrum? 
it's not E, that's ECM. I think it's W or something. Uh, I bought anyway. I bought a. I bought an energy bomb as well. Okay. So, um, so there we go. <laughs> uh, right. Let's figure out where we're going. Right. We're going to Quayin, which is in range. That's a Confederacy. That's not too bad. But we will be low on fuel when we arrive. So there we go. Let's go there. I'm going to stick. I'm going to be careful of anarchy systems because obviously it's E. No, it can't be E. E is ECM. Pretty sure we use ECM, isn't it? Yeah, just check. Yeah, <laughs> I think it may be W. Or, I, no, G is for galactic hyperspace jump. I don't want to press anything now because I might trigger it and it's expensive. Right, I'm still going to murder this ship because that's just a Cobra. Um, boom. Um, I, yeah, my overlay's over there. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got the box out actually at the moment. Um, there's some tasty cargo. Let's get and grab that. Right, I've got to stay alive. I should really have saved that on the last space station actually, thinking about it. I'll do that when we get to the next one. Oh, that's not killed. It's W. It is W. I thought it was W. That My muscle memory was coming back and I think, yeah, W feels right. So. W is the energy bomb, so if I get into serious trouble, I can trigger the energy bomb. Now, the energy bomb is a totally OP weapon in the universe of Elite. Because it basically wipes out every other ship on the scanner. So it's basically a weapon of last resort. So actually, we could go back through an anarchy system on our way to places, knowing that we've got that. It's kind of your, it's like a smart, a smart bomb. You remember in games like Defender and things like that, which were around at this sort of time, a little bit older. Um... You know, it's like a clear the entire level. Boom! Imagine, <laughs> yeah, imagine if it was in ED. Um, interesting enough, according to the law of the energy bomb, uh, the way it worked was inducing an overload in the hyperspace drives or engines, I think, of the ships. So um, nasty, right? Um, fortunately, none of the other vessels in the elite dangerous in the elite universe had the energy bomb. Only the player. <laughs> Otherwise, I suppose you could wander into a system and suddenly, boom, <laughs> your game would be over, which would be a bit mean. Um, there's a pirate very close to the system space, which is unusual. And then we'll get to the space station, hopefully. Just pick up the cargo. Textiles, that's a bit dull. There we go, and the space station. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it would be a bit mean if you just got energy bombed. You just got energy bombed. Oh, game over. <laughs> uh, yeah, that would be a bit mean. Uh, so, right, fuel is good. And uh, I'm going to save. <laughs> and let's keep heading. Now, we were heading, we wanted to head up. We've come down a bit actually. I wanted to get across to there, so I kind of want to go up there, but I can't get in range of those systems. So I'm going to have to go there, I think, to give me a chance to get into that system over there. So what's that? That is a Confederacy. That's relatively safe again. So yeah, putting an energy bomb on the ship. So I must remember W is my get out of trouble button. That cost me 900 credits a time, which is quite expensive for this game. Bear in mind, on the leet, you start with 100 credits only and, and no equipment on your ship. It takes you a while to build up the cash to get a decent ship. But as you can see, I'm just murdering my way through space. <laughs> um, now, most of like that, that was a trading vessel. Most of them are pretty lightweight compared to you. It's the bounty hunters that you want to worry about, which have do have decent ships. Oh, narcotic. Well, he actually, that's interesting. Now, this is this is just RNG, of course, the deciding what I pick up. But interesting enough, you know, if you think about it from a, a role play perspective, that was an innocent trader <laughs> smuggling narcotics. So maybe I did the universe a favour. <laughs> so I can justify my my rampacious destruction of everything by the fact you might be carrying narcotics, <laughs> just like I was. Um, Oh, this is an asp. 
I think I mentioned it before, but in the universe of Elite, an ASP is an ex-military ship, uh, not an exploration vessel as it is in Elite Dangerous. And the ASP um, design, ASP Mark One. I'm not sure if the one we have in Elite Dangerous is called the ASP Explorer, which kind of implies to me it's a later design. This one is the ASP Mark One, and while it does look similar, you know, obviously given the nature of the graphics, it is. Um, it's not quite the same. Ah, no, this is a, this is the annoying thing, right? Because this space station doesn't like me, so I can't I can't dock, um, which is a faff, <laughs> because I've murdered somebody. <laughs> They've taken the exception. So that's a multi-government system. So let's go there and see if they'll let me dock. So sometimes you have to backtrack around. Um, yeah, so Asp was smaller than the original D. Yeah, so I think it's it was a military vessel. Um, there's a pirate already. And um but you know it's nice to see that Elite Dangerous has reference to the original ship. So you've got Sidewinder, that's Elite, Cobra, that's Elite, Asp, that's Elite, Crate, that's Elite, Python, that's Elite, uh, Anaconda, that's Elite. Um ships that haven't yet made an appearance uh, are things like the Gecko and the Boa. I uh, don't think the Moray has been seen in Elite Dangerous. No, that's not a ship. There we go, some nice juicy cargo. More pirates appearing. And uh, oh, there's two behind me. I hate it when it does that. <laughs> Let's get this one first. So this will probably be sidewinders or crates at this point. Uh, they usually hunt in packs in Elite. Yeah, that's a sidewinder. It won't last long, that's good. Right, now, now here's the thing. My front shield is down at this point, so I should just be cautious. Right, I'm going to keep those two to my tail for a moment while my front shield comes back up. There it goes. Um, something I do like in this game, which I, which I think in some ways is missing from the Elite Dangerous, is the idea of having front and rear shields. So it does give you some tactical abilities to have a front and rear shield because I've got a full rear shield at this point so I can use that to give my energy banks a chance to recharge as that um, sidewinder comes in behind me it'll probably start firing on me again um, which in fact it hasn't there it goes right it's now hitting my rear shield and as the rear shield comes down my energy banks have had a chance to recharge which gives me the option to come around and then deal with it So, you know, there are all nice little tactical options that you can play with in this game, given the fact that you've got a front and a rear shield. Um, there's a missile. That's no threat to me now because I've got the ECM, which is what that strange noise is. Now, Sidewinders are actually... They can be quite deadly. They're not very strong ships, but they are fast and manoeuvrable, as you can see. Um, and the problem is sometimes dealing with them takes too long and what that means is that other ships can come and get you <laughs> so they're really they're really um, quite irritating and that also I mean the game is you know the game is the game but you know they can shoot accurately from a much further range than you can <laughs> So at this point, with the third energy unit down, I need to not attack something until I've got power back in my ship. That's the way the original game works. Four energy banks, two shields. Um, yeah, so later games, I mean, things like X-Wing, didn't they? They had the ability to route power from engines to shields and um, things. Elite doesn't have that, but at least, yeah, it's got that forward and back shield. Uh, yeah, and you can put you can put gun emplacements on the right and the left. I haven't done that. I have got a mining laser on the back, which is occasionally useful for pot shotting other ships. Um, right, so that is a innocent python which is minding its own business, but that's unfortunate that it's, it's spawned in my uh, my part of the woods. And because it's facing away from me, it's not even going to get a shot in before it dies. I don't think. There we go. Um, so yes, the murdering continues. <laughs> um, there we go, right. 
So somebody was putting a comment in, no real laser, yes, yes, I do have a real laser, yes. So I could I could use that, but I find flying backwards. Now there is actually a kind of a cheat on the spectrum, I think. I think if you pause the game and there's a button you can press, which swaps the axes around, so you can actually fly your ship backwards, which means when you're looking backwards, you can um, <laughs> effectively fly normally, if that makes sense. Um, so, um, so that's quite good. Now, Elite Dangerous obviously is used the pip balancing system, which is which I do quite like the ability to transfer different levels of power to different systems. Um, so that stuff is, is fun for tactical play, you know, giving you opportunities for those things. Um, but I do like the idea of front and rear shields, and I think I'm right in saying that it was considered for Elite Dangerous early on. Um, certainly, I remember some of the. Um, you know, the early, uh, really early, you know, pre-game, pre-game videos, um, having um, the concept of ships having multiple shields, possibly, you know, up to maybe even four, so you could have left and right shields, and if one went down, you could transfer power, and all those kind of cool things. Those, those never happened, but, um, this is a Cobra, which will start firing missiles at me, as you can see, They're inconsequential to the ECM. Um... Was there a ship that was faster backwards in Frontier Elite? I don't know, don't recall that. I know some of them had some design flaws, which meant they didn't actually work properly. There we go, we managed to dock with the space station this time. Um, have you played the Russian hack of Elite 3 on the spec? No, I haven't. I have noted it though, so I will definitely give that one a go at some point. Um, right, fuel. Right, so I'm going to save my game because I'm learning. There we are. <laughs> um, and oh, no, we can't quite get to it's right just out of range literally just out of range so we're going to have to go through this system in order to get there we need to get up to that part of the chart As one of the things that's in the original game is that the maximum jump distance is 7 light years you can't extend it there's no way to it. 7 light years is all you get and um, you can jump at less than that but you can only jump maximum of um of seven light years, which does give you that. Right, I'm going to have to be good because this system seems to take a front to me murdering its populace. <laughs> um, so I'm going to leave this, leave that ship this time. Um, and what that may mean, I'm still fugitive at the moment. So, but I'm a, a slightly more well-behaved fugitive. Um, I can watch the Cobra go past. There it is. Um, uh, <laughs> than I was before. Um, so two-dimensional thinking. There we are, Frank Miner. That's from that's from Star Trek: The Wrath of Khan, of course. So yes, two-dimensional thinking. We don't do that. Um. <laughs> I'll just wait for the Cobra to disappear off the rear screen. Once it despawns, we can accelerate on the Taurus drive once more. So the Taurus drive is is quite like. Um, the frame shift drive in many ways, leading to speculation that the technology of this era, which if you know your law, and you've been following my law streams, you'll know that the the law and the uh, level of technology actually dropped between this game and the um, two subsequent games, Frontier Elite 2 and Frontier First Encounters. Hyperspace slowed down significantly um, and intrasystem travel became, you know, you had to do it in you know, on conventional engines only and use time compression to, to get there. Look, there's, there's another dodgy pirate. Whereas in this era, which is pre that, we've got a sort of inter-system drive which allows us to fly around quite happily uh, at super, super duper speeds. Um, and this is the Galcop era. And uh, the other two games, by the point you get to them, Galcop has collapsed and that technology appears to have been lost. So you regress a little bit until you get to Elite Dangerous and the frame shift drive, which brings you back to the same sort of level of things. Now that's obviously all that, mostly just about the gameplay of the games, but the law does explain why it is the way it is, which I always find quite interesting. Right, now we should, yes, it was still out of range. 6.8 light years is right on the edge. There we go, we can make it. So let's save. Um, so yeah. Uh, put a military laser on. Well, I've kept I've kept a um, I've kept a mining laser on the back simply because occasionally I, you know it's, it's useful to be able to mine something. I've, I've demonstrated that a couple of times. Um, 
So, right, what sort of system are we in? This is a dictatorship, so it won't be too bad. That allows us to travel up around this spur here, which which would be quite good. Good. Okay, so that's that's good. Full speed on main engines, take us into the station. Um, Now what we could do here is th do a Thargoid run. Now for those of you who haven't seen it, I think a lot of you have. Now I, all I've got to do is be a bit careful. What I might do is save it every time I do a kill a, a series of Thargoids. Um, because that's a very fast way to up your kill count and get quite a lot of money, which actually will be quite useful. And what you want is two systems separated by a very short distance. So I think that's going to be my plan for a bit and see how many Thargoids I can murder um, with the ship. It's it's relatively risky because um, you quite often die, but um, what I'll do is I'll return to my save if I do, uh, and I'm guaranteed quite a lot of kills by doing that. Um, and we're not sure whether or not the Spectrum version values certain types of kill above other types of kill. Um, I'm not convinced it does, but... Um, there's some speculation. I think Commander Ariok might might want to lean in on that that one as to whether or not you get more points for a Thargoid than you do for other ships. It's not entirely sure. Um, notice I've dropped to Offender now because I've been good for a couple of rounds. Um, then it um, you know it, it, it plays me off. So it uh, it doesn't. Okay, so that was a mistake. So we th we we don't think uh, that, that's good. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, but it is a guaranteed way to get some money and some kills. So Let's give it a whirl. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sell the cargo I've got on board because I don't need that. So let's do that. Might as well. Um, three, two, two. Two tons of narcotics. Always nice. And four tons of alloys. There we go. So that's that's made me a little bit of money. Right. So we lock our destination onto. Bring that back there. Um, now I have to pause the game in a minute, so I'm going to save before we do this. Great being able to save your position instantly on the emulator. Um, uh, Dragon Eye says, thousand hours played on, never had to do it before, I misread the route. Uh, oh, there are a few rats. Yeah, yeah no, they're good guys. I've I got myself rescued by them once. I kind of deliberately ran out of fuel. Not kind of on purpose um, in order to see what the process was like so I could put it in premonition so there's a, there's a there is a fuel rat rescue in premonition which I kind of engineered a bit because I wanted to engineer it in a lowercase e sense <laughs> so I just wanted to see how it worked um, so some lucky um, fuel rat who I can't remember who it was now but um, totally at random got picked by me to rescue me and they got immortalized in the book <laughs> um, Right, in order to get the Thargoid stuff to happen, I've got to put the game into pause, press a special button, and then come out. Now, when I have space now, we will get we will get Thargoids instead. So, fingers crossed, I can survive this. But it's interesting, we don't think it's going to give us any extra points, so... That's one down. Two down. It's quite a high risk strategy, as you can see. Uh, there's the other one. Should be able to get these guys. Boom! There we go. All Thargo is destroyed, and I've got quite a nice lot of materials to gather up here. just alloys actually not very particularly interesting but there are a couple of Thargons out there as well which are the little remote controlled ships that the uh, Thargoids sh shoot out in order to defend themselves against you which is which is quite a nice little game mechanic it's quite similar to what we see in Elite Dangerous again I think I just missed that I missed that alloy there it is, it's over there Brrr. 
do need to, because the problem is they do float out of range quite fast, so I need to get on these and pick them up before they do that. And I'll get some alien items, which is quite good. So let's see if I can scoop this one. Nice and fast, it's running it. It's flying at quite a speed, actually. I hope the other one doesn't run out of range before I get it. It's going to be quite tight, actually. This is the Thargon. Now, the Thargon becomes inactive when you kill the mothership, so it's quite... Uh, yeah, they're quite a threat when the mothership is around because if a Thargoid is any a real a Thargoid mothership is about, then the Thargons are active. The moment you destroy the Thargon motherships, then the Thargons just become dead. They're sort of remote controlled craft, um, a bit like the swarm that you get in Elite Dangerous, which attacks you if you've ever tried taking on a, a Thargoid in Elite Dangerous. Oh, that's just that's a bit boring. That's just a piece of alloy as well. Uh, Right, so let's save the game there. And if I try and hyperspeed back, because I've got that mode enabled, it will just chuck me into Thargoid again. Um, and it will keep doing that until such time as I turn it off. There, come on, full speed. Oh, no, that is not good. So I'm gonna reload that. <laughs> I hate it when it does that. Because you can pick up damage. Yep. No, so we're trying to trigger this mission. Definite cheat there, yes. So, sorry, ex absolute exploit going on. Oh. Yeah, hitting me hard this time. So, this is why it's risky. This is not going to work. Oh, no. Oh, ha, ha. No. I think we'll go back to my previous load. This was not a good idea. Let's go back here, turn that mode off. I think if it is literally um, just, let's go onwards rather than back. If it's literally just kill count and one kill is one count, we just need to keep murdering our way through space and traveling, I think, and hopefully this mission's gonna trigger. So, I th <laughs> those of you who haven't seen the Thargoid evasion, that, that's, that's the, th well, that's the sort of Thargoid hype addiction, I suppose, in Elite. So I just literally just need to be murdering my way around. Now that encounter you can force on the spectrum by that sort of cheat mode, um, but uh, it did occasionally happen anyway, but it wasn't very common. I don't, I don't recall how often, it, it definitely did occur, but it didn't, I, I think you kind of tended not to get it until you were sort of elite or dangerous or deadly or something. Um, and again, without going through the code, it's not entirely clear what triggers what in the game. Um, we've got pirates. So is this, a, I bet this is, an, this is an anarchy system. Right, okay, now let's, what I'm gonna do then is be as careful as I can in here and save every so often. Because we don't want to lose our kill counts that we've built up. Because this can be quite nasty. Because we can't really hit these ships until they turn into, like that, the actual wireframes. Uh, here's the tactics on this one. Now there is another ship coming in, but what you do, you've got to fly a little bit defensively for a bit. Keep it behind you until your energy units are recharged, and then turn around and get it. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to be tactical. <laughs> I think now an anarchy system will give us the kills we want, but they are dangerous because if we get jumped, um, there are some ships in the game that are faster than we are, and effectively can keep us within range of their weapons. You can see even with one ship, um, it can hit you, they can hit your shields quite hard now. So that was okay. So the trick here is once you scoop the cargo, um, then again, you get spawned another one already, but I'm gonna hold still with my engines off, basically, until my shields are up. So I've got to, I've got to be clever. I've got to be, I've got to fly defensively, even though I'm a pirate. Um, and uh, so situational awareness, like in any combat situation, is is uh, is a good thing. Now, as you saw at the beginning of the game, I was being a bit too blasé, and the game punished me, which I think I think is good gameplay design. 
This is a cobra, by the way. There we go, got him. Okay, so again, took shield down. Now the problem I have is when no, it's spawning more alien. Okay, so what I shouldn't do at this point is charge in. Okay, now I've also got to look at it. You can see that the, one of those is flickering slightly. That means there are two ships there, uh, which I can point in that direction. And they will head towards me pretty fast. So I don't really want the one that's on my right to get into range. Um, there go my front shields already. I, it's not really worth me firing until I can see the wireframes. You can hit them, but it's not easy to do so. So I'm going to actually throttle back and try and get this one before, there we go, before he turns away. And since I'm here, I might as well, before I turn around, just try and do a manoeuvre and pick up the thing. Now the other one's behind me. I've got to get him into range. Oh, here he goes again. Five past him. Ah, oh, he ran me. <laughs> oh, this game is hard. It is hard. Quick load. All right, there we go again. I thought I was doing all right there. Dear, oh dear. <laughs> right, have I switched the Thargoid thingy off or not? Let's find out. I can't remember. I think I just went the wrong way as well. I think I did. Let's just find out. I've got a feeling that Thargoid thog thing is switched off. Yeah, it is. Uh, let me switch that off first. Right. And we went up. There we are. Right. We've got this is this is the way to <laughs> have to concentrate really maybe I got missiled it was difficult to tell um, I didn't did, did, was there a, was there a, was there an incoming um, was there an incoming missile warning or something I didn't see it um, maybe that flickered briefly so I was trying to concentrate so again so <laughs> situational awareness okay I've got to be I've got to be as careful as possible um, but you can see this game is still a challenge even today. You know, I've got I've got everything on the ship I need. I should have hit the energy bomb, shouldn't I? But it seems such a waste to use an energy bomb on a sidewinder. But yeah, needs must. Oh, I shot a missile now. That's always always a high point. Could have been a missile at point blank range. It was difficult to tell. They do do that. They do do that. The AI will shoot missiles at you when it thinks it's got an advantage, which um, is quite often at point blank range. So I sometimes trigger the ECM. Um, to avoid that, yeah, as a kind of preemptive move. Now that's actually an innocent ship. But okay, we're just after kill count now, so let's let's murder and pillage. It's an anarchy system, so what does he expect? <laughs> oh, somebody saw a brief glimpse. It could have been a missile. Okay, so maybe he missiled me at point blank range, which is a which is a good move. Okay, um, so I can't argue with his tactics. So again, um, so every so often, once I get out of a, a decent scrap, then I will I will save the game. And we've got, we're trying to preserve the, <laughs> the kill count progress because we want this mission to trigger. And get another ship down. I don't mind making a bit of money on the side, of course, but yeah, there we go. Um, let's keep let's keep pushing on. See if we can get this. Supernova mission to trigger. I mean, <laughs> by the time we get it, it's going to be a complete anticlimax, of course. Everyone's going to go, oh, is that it? Um, and literally all that happens is, you, I think you have to fly to the space station at a certain given time, pick up something, and then fly away again. Um, but, you know, it's, it's cool. You see it. You see the mission. Interesting enough, for Command Ariok, roughly how long do you feel you were playing? Before it, you know, the, the supernova mission triggered. I might say maybe the next right on commander is the is the actual trigger for it. Well, it's it's chucked it's chucked more ships at me again. All right, so what have I got here? I've got one ahead of me at least. Okay, one. So there's three ships. Okay, All right. So these again will be crates and sidewinders, but as you can see, they're quite dangerous in combination. That one's got in range. Right. If you can hit the sidewinders, you're doing good. 
again it's locking down my shields gotcha next up right one left that's possibly the crate given it's coming in slightly slower So this time, I need to wait before I move anywhere <laughs> and get my shields up. Oh, narcotics. We always like that. Um, so sit still, um, which sort of, because you generally find the pirates only spawn when you use the tourist drive. Um, there we go. The shields are coming back up. So I will save it there, preserve that so we can move on. This will be a bounty hunter in a Ferdilance. So generally they spawn in front of you and just come barreling in straight at you. Yep, Ferdilance. That's because I am... Actually, no, that looks like a Viper. Yeah, it is a Viper. This is a police ship. So now I'm murdering the cops. And that was a missile as well, I think I got there. That's always nice. So just literally flying around at the moment murdering anything that comes along. So two pirates bracketing me. Um, the worst thing I have ever think I've seen on the Spectrum, I think it can spawn a maximum of five pirates at you. So I think that's the worst I've ever seen. There we go. Two is usually absolutely fine. Four is when it starts getting interesting because it can get a bit stressy. As you've seen me die a few times. Um, this is like, ah, so this is slightly annoying when it spawns an extra ship. Sometimes it's just a trader, which means it's okay. It won't do anything until I attack it. But occasionally it will spawn another pirate while you're in the midst of fighting the ones you've already got, which is really annoying. So that one's okay. The nice thing, of course, I can save. Because the, the Spectrum save files are effectively just a snapshot of um, memory. Uh, haven't heard any keyboard intermissions yet. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll I should do some of those. Um, I was just thinking, we know we have a topic actually. What time is it? It's, it's coming up for, for, for two now, isn't it? Um, we know we have a kind of... Oh, now I've got troubles because that's not what I thought it was. Thanks. <laughs> Sporting lots of ships at me. This was a mistake. There we are, I've got that one. Now I've got two sidewinders. Missile. Very nice. Got that one. Yeah, right. Okay, so. Stop firing at me. Dodge around a bit. See if I can get behind them. There's that sidewinder. I hate sidewinders. <laughs> yeah, the game, the game, the game's got my attention. Now that's oh, that's the that is a bounty hunter. That's a third lance flying around there, come to kill me. He's after the bounty on me. And that's actually potentially quite a nasty ship. Um, so yeah, so we normally have a topic. I was thinking maybe some musical interludes because <laughs> obviously there's all the. Um, all the pop songs and things from the 1980s as well. So there's a, there's a couple of those that I thought I would definitely. Hang on, this is I don't know if these guys have got missiles or not. I can't remember where the third lance. I don't they often fight these in. Sort of should you'd expect. There's a missile. There we go. Two missiles from a third lance. That doesn't do him any good. And they tend to only fire when they're getting desperate. So, oops. Ow. Of that. Don't ram a piece of debris if you can help it. That rips a shield and an energy bank away, which is pretty fatal. Right, let's just let that recharge. Now, this could be another asteroid or that could be an anaconda. <laughs> it's impossible to tell on the Spectrum version. Um, it was an asteroid. There we go. So, so anyway, so brief interlude. So. There's no risk active. No, no I was thinking, stuff that was around at this time was things like, um, um, oh, who remembers um, OMD, things like this. Something like that, anyway. 
<laughs> know the gay, that's it. Yeah, OMD. So that, that was that's a big favourite of mine. <laughs> like that sort of stuff. Um, still listen to that, actually. And then there's... Um, um, so was it um, Depeche Mode, of course? Oh, we've got pirates coming in. Better get, better get off the keyboard. Deal with the pirates. <laughs> uh, we'll come back to it. We'll come back to Depeche Mode in a moment. Um, and and, and my, my, the good thing is my, my playing is so bad that it doesn't get picked up by copyright infringement. <laughs> Which I suppose I should be slightly insulted by, actually. But hey, what can you do? Um, but yeah, so there was a lot of good music around in that, that time. I mean, there's good music all the time, of course, but um, very, very kind of 80s-y stuff. <laughs> Just can't get enough of Depeche Mode. <laughs> I see what you did there. Oh. Little sidewinder with a pulse laser, right. Let's just save that again. Uh, so yeah, so that's... Um, uh, what was that there? That's just can't get enough, isn't it? Oh, be <laughs> you get no peace. I just want to play my keyboard. <laughs> Bloody ship comes along and shoots me. Stop attacking me. Oh, he's trying hard, this guy. Oh, that was close. <laughs> so that was a that's a bounty hunter, and he is uh, yeah, he came very close to killing me there. Well, I wasn't looking, playing the keyboard. Um, take that, you. Excellent. So yeah, let's just let that recharge again. <laughs> so anyway, I've probably done enough in another game, but that's that's the sort of. <laughs> <laughs> the sounds attracting them. <laughs> Don't like your playing. <laughs> That's probably very, very true, actually. So, um, um, and what was it? Was it Electric Dreams by Human League? So done them space songs. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Um, um, French dude on synth. Um, Jean-Michel Jarre. Jean-Michel Jarre. All right, hang on. There's a ship behind me. Let's go murder that. We'll do some Jean-Michel Jarre. Uh, yes, that was. Did anybody go? Um, I went to one of Jean-Michel Jarre's concerts in. The, I think it must have been 80, 87 or eighty-eight. Um, the Docklands concert. Did anybody else go to that? Um, that was great. That was the, you know, I think the second or the third concert I'd been to. My dad came <laughs> along with me because uh, he liked Jean-Michel Jean music. Oh, actually, that's not a ship. That's just a piece of debris. Um, okay, that's good. Uh, let's just point back. Yeah, hang on. Jean-Michel Jean. Now, Jean-Michel Jean, if you don't know Jean-Michel Jean, his album Oxygen is the perfect accompaniment for space games, okay? So, ah, I'm ambushed by pirates. <laughs> uh, right, hang on. Let's let's save this because this looks like it's going to be a furball. It's a problem with anarchy system. You get a chance to stop. Oh, shot at range. Now that's that's elite material. That is, got him. That's going to be disappointing for them. I've still got my sh almost. I hate it when it does that. Ah, oh, lost the docking computers. That's mean. That's expensive as well. Rockers. So this is the game upping the difficulty a bit. Ow. Missile. Oh. Oh, I'm going to do that again because that was. <laughs> Glad I saved it there. All right, let's try again. <laughs> I know I'm cheating, but we're, we're cheating for an honest reason. I'm trying to get... Oh, see, this is not going as well this time. Already. <laughs> Lost my fuel that time. Oh, I've got one. Ow, 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 ow. I've got the dodge. Come on. 
No, I'm not going to make it. This is hard. All right, try again. Let's get the other guy first. Doesn't seem to matter which one I choose. The others seem to be in range. Maybe I've saved it too late. I've got to find my, fight my way out of this verbal. Ideally, without using the missiles. Week again. All right, I don't want to. I'm not going to fire on this one because I need to get in behind him and let my shields come back up. I need some energy. Look, completely shattered shields. So I'm not going to fire him because he'll fire a missile at me. I don't want that. All right, now I've got a little bit of shield strength back. I can have at him again. Gotcha, little rotters. <laughs> right, what I'm going to do is try and get to the space station, then we'll do Jean Michel Jean. Because <laughs> um, I'm never going to make it otherwise. Right, I'm going to save that. Uh, for some reason, you don't get to see the menu that pops down, but there we go. Energy bomb. I could, I could have energy bombed it, but I was trying to avoid it. Now, I lost all my fuel there, but uh, that's not too much of a problem. All right, I'm going to have to fight my way to this space station. So let's do that. Let's get to the space station, then we can then we can have another musical interlude. Because I'm not going to let the problem with the anarchy system is I'm just not going to be left in peace on the way in. It just isn't going to happen. This looks like a cobra, I think. It should be. The cobra is quite a nice, easy target, to us because it's quite a big ship. It's one of you know in in the elite universe, it's actually one of the bigger ones, um, other than the anaconda asteroid thing. Computer's nice, we don't mind that. Yeah. So literally just going to murder our way into the space station. I think hopefully an anarchy system will be able to dock. That was just a another part. We're getting close to the space station, which is good. Oh, there was a little brief flicker of the S there. Sometimes you can get that on the screen and hit the docking computer and sort of teleport yourself out of trouble, which is which is nice. Um, oh, they do hit hard now though. Gotcha, you rotter. Let's get that ally there. Right, almost. Right, see that little S flickering out? Oh, I missed it. Should be a little bit more. There we go, made it. Yes! <laughs> Uh, Skywire, hello there, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, I'm doing very well, other than the fuel leak, as you saw there. Uh, we're, we're, not doing, we're not doing too bad, we're not doing too bad. Oh, I need to, no, not that one. Which is, where's my, no, where's the cargo hold? It's not that one. Which button is it? Yeah. Let's enter, there we go, All right. Um, one. One, sell all this, set ourselves up for the next bit. So we haven't triggered the mission yet. Um, but we had a bit of cool stuff on board. We've now got 7,000 credits, so yeah, that's that's all right. Um, I don't think there's anything we can buy at this point in time. Um, that's kind of worth buying, no, not really. Um, I've got the fuel, right, let's save the position. Right, quick, quick Jean-Michel Jarre interlude. Um, so yeah, so if you haven't, if you don't know Jean-Michel Jarre, he's a, I guess he must have been born in the 50s. I think he's still alive. Um, French French composer, very, very good on synths. Had a massive, massive hit in the 70s with uh, with Oxygen. And um, yeah, so and I'm, you know, yeah, this is not doing justice to his music at all, but <laughs> very, very cool tracks. It's much more. It's, it's much better than that. Um, but check out Oxygen. If you haven't 
listen to Oxygen because it's pretty old now. It's a 70s album, um, but it's perfect for space. OK, it's absolutely perfect for space games. It's got that sort of kind of, you know, oh, magnetic fields is, um, uh, how does that one go? Uh, that sort of, no, uh, no, that's Oxygen I'm thinking of. Uh, magnetic fields is, oh, I can't remember how that goes. Zoo, zoo, uh, zoo's pretty good, videos, yeah, so um, then you've got um, Equinox, it's sort of like this, isn't it? Anyway, so that's quite good. Um, but the most, the one that he's most famous for, I suspect, is the Rendezvous album, uh, which is um, Rendezvous Four. Actually, it's always number four. It tends to be an upbeat track. Um, I don't know if that's a Jean-Michel Jarre signature thing, but you know, track number four is always the upbeat one, and um, um, Rendezvous is this one. magnetic fields so they're all good they're good <laughs> rich room so so yeah so this is literally this is my little I, I i this is a tiny little arcade keyboard it's miniature but i just use it for putting melodies in i actually have a proper piano downstairs but obviously that's not very portable so i can't bring it up here um but um you know so that sort of stuff is good and so we had depeche mode wasn't it So that's that that was that was good oh Vienna I, I, I don't know if I, I'd have to go and play that see if I could work that way um uh yeah ultra but ultravox was good that was that was good ultravox was awesome stuff um and um so the best mode human league omd we did didn't we So that's good. And Jean-Michel Jarre. Oh, Vangelis. Um, did he do? Um, was Vangelis the? Um, I'm trying to remember. I don't think Vangelis did. Um, uh, the one I'm thinking of is a different one. This one is, uh, maybe maybe it is Vangelis. Tell me. See, if, I can't even remember the name of the tune, but it goes like this. Is that is that is, is that is that Vangelis? <laughs> that's Albi though. Um, Tangerine Dream. Oh yeah, see that's getting a bit later. That's the um, um, I haven't, I haven't learned that one yet. Actually, that's the, what the theme tune from Tangerine Dream did. Um, the theme tune to that motorbike thing. What was that? Um, oh, your rhythmics. Yeah, no, I do like the it's, all, it's all sorts of stuff. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna have to learn a few more of these um, in in my kind of in in the, in the week. See if I can pick some up. Um, so yeah, some, some, so so is that? Is, I'm not sure if that's Vangelis or not, um, but that's quite good. Um, yeah, so it's all good stuff. Um, uh, what else did I have this week? But things like that. Uh, chariots of fire. Oh yeah, chariots of fire. Yeah, 
yeah, so that was good. Can I do the Blade Runner field? <laughs> that like, that's just sort of do little do little do little like that. <laughs> I don't think I could play fast enough. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, so oh, well, my gold field. Um, oh, what, what was the other one? Um, that's my gold field. I can't remember the tune. What's this song? Oh, Moonlight Shadow! <laughs> Thank you very much! <laughs> it's driving me potty, I can hear it in my head. I was like, I'm sure that's my Goldfield. Um, classic 80s tunes. Um, so, yes. <laughs> that's oh, actually, left. well, I did play that the other week, but let's do that again, because that's, that's, that is a favourite of mine. It's a lovely one to play. Yeah, it definitely was Moonlight Shadow. Yeah, you're quite right. So um, Axel F is sort of actually it's got the bass line, so which I can't this this keyboard's only two octaves. Um so let me do the bass line on its own, which is like this. So that's the that's the bass line, that sort of keeps rolling round. <laughs> and then you kind of got the, the the main theme, which is. And then you've got a sort of refrain, which is higher up. So I have to press a button to make the octave go up. trying to move the octave around by a button which it really kind of does your head in there as a musician um, not that I am a musician but there we go anyway that's <laughs> enough of that for the moment <laughs> um, we should we should crack on because we still haven't triggered the mission have I saved I don't know if I've saved um, but yeah so that we, we will discuss some of the stuff that's around this era of the game and there's lots of iconic stuff that I just associate with elite which is things like Axel F and all that sort of music um, so <laughs> it's quite it's quite nostalgic to go fade to grey who was that by was that uh is that ultravox no fade to grey yeah um i can't remember who that's by either visage oh yeah yeah, yeah visage oh i've got to dig out some of i've got these albums i've got to got to dig out some of the <laughs> some of these albums now um so, um, yeah, oh, it's chuck that noise you can hear, by the way, is the rain again. <laughs> it's come back. Um, it's now chucking it down <laughs> outside the house again. Uh, let me just, just go look over. Full straight to camera. Okay, look, because this is it's it's absolutely hammering it down <laughs> out there. Um, really quite dramatic um, sort of stuff going on. It's sort of hail and. Yeah, I suppose it's probably just normal normal British weather for this time of year, but it's making a little bit of a racket outside. Um, oh, I'm under attack! Ah! Let me keep your eyes off the screen. Ah, I can't get any control. Um, this game doesn't let off for a minute, does it? Dear, oh dear. Right, come on in. I want a piece of me, do you? Wow. Well, Gonna have to get up pretty darn early in the AM. I put the keyboard away and everything. <laughs> uh, that would be a sign. Oh no, it's a crate again. Which way are you going? You're going that way, are you? Alright, so I'm gonna tuck in behind you. Hopefully. Yes. You're doomed. Must all dive away, but it's not gonna do you any good. Boom. I 
I'm even pointing at the planet at the end. Oh, narcotics. We like a bit of narcotics. Okay, so what sort of system have we done? Another anarchy system. <laughs> Alright, I've got the energy bomb this time. So let's fight our way to the planet again, see if we can do that. Because that does us a lot. Oh! Wife has appeared in the midst of combat. <laughs> We need tea in the midst of combat. Tea in, tea in the midst of combat. <laughs> Not sure, that's a very good protocol. <laughs> Highly distracting. When a cup of tea is <laughs> on your dashboard in the midst of. Uh, I do love my wife, she's funny. Um, uh, actually, for those of you who don't know, um, in about two weeks, actually. Um, on the 6th of June, we're having a special Saturday stream, so there won't be an elite day, uh, won't be an elite spectrum stream. I think it's two or three weeks. Must be must be down to two weeks by now. Um, on the 6th of June, you're all very welcome to come along, but I'm not going to be doing a elite playthrough. I'm actually going to be celebrating my 25th wedding anniversary um, with said Mrs. Drew, who you just sort of saw deliver a cup of tea. <laughs> Obviously, because she's my wife. Um, that's how these things work. Um, and so, um, oh, look at this. It's just chucked me a bunch of weapons. I'm not even going to get to enjoy my cup of tea straight away. Right, onwards we go. Right, so let's do some murdering. Get rid of these pirates. Oh, more thunder. So we've got, we've got weather. We've got pirates. We've got 80s nostalgia. Very, very bad synth playing. Cup of tea. What could you want on a Saturday afternoon? One thing you'll notice me, I've pro I, I ought to start doing actually, because I don't think I've even shown you how this works. Let me show you here. Um, I've not been using missiles, and oh, hang on, I won't show you here because now I'm starting to attack uh, from another ship. Let's just turn around. One of the things I don't tend to use very much in the original League is the missiles. And there's a reason for that, is because they're really, really rubbish. So and I'll show you how rubbish they are by firing one at this ship. Okay, so I don't think you've even seen me launch a missile before because I just know they don't work. Most of the time, they never, they won't hit the target. Um, and that the reason for that is actually down to maths. Okay, so here we go. Missile away. Okay, now watch. It's almost certain not to hit. I'm going to give it a chance. There you go, look. It's <laughs> Where's it going? <laughs> so the missile will probably fly around for yonks now, um, being a danger to both me and the other ship. So missiles on Elite are, are, are almost entirely useless unless... Let's see, it's still flying about. Um, unless you um, don't move. Okay, now the reason for that is very simple, is that the game, unlike Elite Dangerous and more modern games, um, where, you know, the universe is effectively static and your ship is moving within the universe, in Elite, the way the maths works, to keep it simple for the, these early computers, is that your ship doesn't move at all, okay, and the entire universe and everything in it is recalculated and moves around you. Um, now what that means is that if you um, don't move then the, the the computer only has to make very simple calculations because the other ships will just do what they're told um, and so will the missiles. But if you are, the moment you maneuver you complicate the maths for the interception code in the AI for the missiles, um, which means that if you move, maneuver your ship, the moment you start maneuvering, um, you effectively screw up the interception 
So your missiles are only only good if you don't manoeuvre. <laughs> Um, which is a small weakness, obviously, in a missile design. Is we, we can fire the missile, so, but it won't hit unless we don't move our ship. Um, this is interesting. I may have to run away again here. Because I've got some bad guys over on that quarter over there. And I really want my cup of tea. <laughs> so, yeah. So, if you'll notice that if you fire a missile at a ship, if you don't manoeuvre then it will probably hit, but they're no use in the midst of combat because you're ducking and diving about. And then the interception code simply doesn't work. It can't work out quickly enough where to turn the missile, so it never hits unless you're at point blank range, which is about the only time when a missile... Oh, now I've got three of them on me again. Where's the other one? So this is when the the UI gets quite mucky. It's quite hard to see what's going on. Let's slow down. Where's the other ship? That's a cargo canister. There it is. Oops, it's Sidewinder. Come here, you. I'm gonna kill ya. Pick up some debris. Oh no! Oh, that is yeah. I thought that was an asp for a moment, uh, but it's not. It's a cargo canister. It's okay. Panic over. Radioactive is always nice. Now I thought there was another pirate on the edge of the scanner, but it seems to have decided to run away, which is not necessarily a bad thing. There we go. Um, so yeah, dumb fire missiles. That's the only way to do it is to hit the opponent point blank range when he's coming towards you because then there's very little possibility for um, the ship to, uh, to, to, to to go and get out of the way so um, you have to be very selective in elite when um, hmm lovely cup of tea um, uh, <laughs> Earl Grey who <laughs> played good sim um, <laughs> no I, well, I do like Earl Grey that's not an Earl Grey I do like Earl Grey, but that's that's a that's a more traditional breakfast tea. Um, so uh, yeah, I should I should really have tea Earl Grey hot, shouldn't I? Um, I mix my genres a lot. <laughs> That'd be a bounty hunter. Right, let's try a missile again. He's probably got an ECM actually. Let's find out. It might be a Viper. Now, if I try not to complicate the approaching vector, it might work. Is it going to work? Yes. See, if you don't manoeuvre, or don't manoeuvre much, <laughs> then you're okay. Um, start doing any complicated twisty turny stuff, you've had it. So there we go. So you've, you've seen me fire a couple of missiles. Um, there you go. They, they, they kind of do work. It's quite satisfying to fire missiles and things, isn't it? Missiles away! You know, all that sort of stuff. Um, how far have I got? Well, we're still on the killing spree, Pete. Um, we haven't seen the mission yet. Um, we're just trying to build up enough. There we go, let's get to the space station. That gives us a good save point. I can have a cup of tea. Is that a fedora hat? Yes, it is. It is indeed a fedora hat. My traditional hat. It's sort of my, sort of my writing hat, really, but I tend to wear it for my streams now because it's just become a thing. <laughs> Um, so what we're trying to do, we're, we're trying to murder and pillage our way across chart two, trying to get this supernova mission to trigger, but of course it's, we don't know what the triggering criteria is, it may just be numbers of kills, um, and so we're just going on, <laughs> just going on. This one is a felt one, which is very comfortable to wear, I can thoroughly recommend a felt one, and as I get older, you see, my thing is that... Um, in the back of my head, I'm aware that my, my dad, um, bless him, back in 2012, died of... Uh, he was 72, so he wasn't super old. Um, died of uh, died of skin cancer. Um, and, um, you know, 72. And I'm, I'm nearly 50 now, so you, you, when you start getting a bit older, those of you who are young, you won't have to worry about this for a bit, but as you start getting older, you start, you start realising there are probably... You get to a point, I think, when you, you realise there are probably fewer years ahead than there are behind. 
um, and um, I'm yeah, I'm 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 going to be fifty in August. But no, I'm, you know, I'm I'm healthy. There's not I've you know, got no major health problems or anything like that. But you know, you you, you do get conscious of these things. Um, Ah, oh, Pete, you found out what the triggering criteria is last night. Oh, do spill the beans. Then we know, then we know what um, then we know what we're aiming for. So yeah, sorry, Dragon Eye, for uh, <laughs> depressing you there. But yeah, it's just one of those things. Okay. So um, my grandfather died at seventy-one. My father died at seventy-two, and I'm fifty. I'm going to be fifty this year. Um, and so I partly wear a hat, and partly because I like wearing hats, but partly because you know it keeps the sun off your head, right? And that can only be a good thing. I don't, I don't like heat. And I don't like, I, you know, I, I like a sunny day, but I don't like the heat. So anything above about 22 degrees centigrade, and I'm getting, no, this is, this is too hot. So actually, I, you know, a lot of people complain about the British weather. I rather, I rather like it because it's actually not too dangerous. Um, and I don't like heat. I can't sleep in it. Um, I'm, you know, I'm actually, um, for those of you who know, I'm actually Canadian by birth. Not that, that really means anything, but... Um, I suspect I'm slightly genetically more inclined to cold weather than I am hot, if that if that's a thing. <laughs> and it keeps it's very practical in the rain. A lot of people go out, you know, with um, umbrellas or and I hate hoods. Hoods I absolutely detest. I don't like my vision or my hearing being constrained. Um, whereas a hat, you know, is brilliant at keeping. All you have to do is tilt it slightly, and the rain will slosh away. Um, your, your head tail is entirely dry and so do your shoulders and everything else that you're wearing as long as you've got a decent raincoat a hat is actually really practical in the rain and everyone thinks you, it's not but it's actually supremely practical for, for, for rain um, so I can thoroughly recommend a hat okay your hat should make a comeback not many people wear it now strictly speaking as a gentleman you shouldn't be wearing a hat indoors but um, you know I'm in space so uh, you know I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pirate <laughs> a space pirate <laughs> so of course I'm wearing a hat <laughs> and I tend to wear a hat to conventions because people, after all these years, have kind of got used to me wearing a hat and <laughs> don't recognise me if I don't have a hat on. So, um, uh, so that's kind of it's part part of the uniform now. And whenever I go out, I just put on a hat, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a thing. And, and generally, I don't wear a hat indoors because you know you've got to be a gentleman, right? But um, uh, for the for the stream, I wear my hat. And I like wearing I like wearing my hat. It's comfortable. Um, <laughs> hats in cars are a dead giveaway of a terrible driver. <laughs> I'm probably not the best driver, to be fair. Um, so I don't tend to wear a hat in a car, actually. That that would be a bit weird. Uh, and I can't wear a hat in my MX-5. For those of you who know, I've got a, a supercharged MX-5, which is as mad as a box of frogs, um, because your hat would get ripped off. <laughs> <laughs> very sharpish. Um, I suppose I could wear one of my other cars, but um, uh, you know, I don't really. Why would you want to wear a hat in a car? That, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So um, uh, I tend to I tend to have a, a very you know um, very trendy. Well, at least it was trendy. Baseball cap for driving in my MX-5, which will stay on my head. But unfortunately, fedoras and things like them generate too much lift at speed. It has been tried and failed. <laughs> Fortunately, I did retrieve said hat um, <laughs> when it was ripped off my head in my MX-5. Um, but um, it, it's not recommended. Um, <laughs> uh, want to know more about the MX-5 generation? It's a Mark One, so the NA version, which is the one with the pop-up headlights, for those of you who don't know what that looks like. Um, so the original MX-5, basically. It is one of the earliest uh, 1.8 versions, really, really early, about 1992 or 93. So um, it's very early. It is British racing green, of course, because we have reasons. Um, whoa, <laughs> that was a really close crate. Um, and uh, but um, because the MX-5 is a bit, let, I mean, it's you know it's got that whole hairdresser's car thing about it that is, is completely unfair actually. And I, I must admit, I, I used to I used to rip people who had MX-5 for it being a hairdresser's car. Um, actually, it's the exact opposite of a hairdresser's car because it would be utterly useless for anybody um, you know who did care about their hair because of course at the moment the roof comes down you've got massive massive turbulence around you. Um, 
Okay. I was going to assume this is unusual for a third land just to be sitting there. So, uh, yeah, I should, I should, I should am, am I fading away? No, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I've got my tea. So yeah, so um, MX-5s are not, they're not headdresses cars. They are actually um, very, very good drivers cars because they have no safety features on them whatsoever. Particularly the original ones, the, the one that I've got with the pop-up headlights. There are, there's no, well, you, you do have powered steering. That's the only thing you do have, um, which I suppose would count as a driver aid. Have a watch this, might have triggered that energy bomb. Gotcha. Um, yeah, you have no driver aids at all. Okay, you've got power steering. You've got no anti-lock brakes. Oh, I've got a bit of weird coloration going. Oh, I think it's the sun outside is causing some slight weirdness with my um, green screen effect. Sorry about that. So I've got a slight, I've got a slight sizzle. I'm going to sit back from the, <laughs> sit back from the screen a bit. And there's another one of these third lances which isn't doing anything. Or is it? Oh, that's the other ship. Yeah, that's the other one. Uh, so yeah, so MX-5, um, no anti-lock brakes, no traction control, um, nothing like that, nothing that would help you survive a crash. My one doesn't even have any airbags, so it's it's really old school stuff, okay? Um, and so, um, you know, it's an old school 1.8 litre engine, um, you know, not hugely fast, to be honest, in, in standard form, um, you know, Tiny little wheels, um, and uh, but it, it's also rear-wheel drive, which for um, which is kind of sort of de rigor for sports cars, really. So you know, if you put your foot down in the wet on the roundabout, um, you're going to go sideways, and if you don't know what you're doing, you'll be in a ditch. <laughs> so that was healthy life started dissolving. Yeah, that's a, that's that's my limited special effects budget. Um, so, so MX-5 is actually not to be driven by the faint-hearted because if you get in an MX-5, and it's particularly an early one, and drive it like a modern car, you will probably kill yourself. Uh, because um, by modern standards, they are not very safe. They would fold up in an accident, against, certainly against a modern car, because they were convertible. Um, and, um, you know, you've got no safety devices on board at all. No seatbelt pretension, there's no airbags, no anti-lock brakes, no traction control, nothing. Uh, just you in a rear-wheel drive car and and they're quite skittish okay you know if you um, aren't gentle with the throttle and you will be backwards along the road and you may well find yourself in a hedge and if you're unlucky you'll find yourself wrapped around a tree <laughs> now what I what I've done with my MX-5 of course is the height of madness what I've done is I've I've, I've bolted a supercharger to it <laughs> because um, oh, this is an anaconda Nice. Come on, launch the two little chappies at me then. Oh, you didn't bother. Maybe they were, maybe maybe they were broken down. Um, so yeah, so I've put a supercharger on mine. For those of you interested in the tech spec, and you can go and look it up. Um, it's an MP62 supercharger, which is actually really designed for two-liter engines. <laughs> so you can see where this is going. Um, and uh, with a bit of fettling and a bit of tweaking and a few other bits and pieces that I've done to it, this, this little MX-5, which weighs about as much as a biscuit tin, I've got a feeling my green screen filter has gone completely, I wonder if it's crashed, because I can see some sort of backgroundy stuff. So yeah, so my MX-5 weighs about as much as a biscuit tin, probably has the aerodynamics actually of a biscuit tin, um, particularly with the roof down, but doesn't really weigh anything at all, it's certainly less than a tonne. And it now has somewhere, we think, in the order of about 220 brake horsepower. <laughs> so it's either utterly terrifying or it's actually quite entertaining, depending on your perspective. <laughs> so that's, that's my MX-5. Um, and it's, it's, it's literally a, a weekend kind of 
toy. It's actually in a box in storage at the moment because uh, because of lockdown. I was planning to do a bit of work on it, and um, you know, I haven't been able to get to it. So, so yes, I have total, total boy racer. You're quite right. Um, and the funny thing is, because it's an MX-5, and it's got little friendly pop-up headlights, and I've kept it ex totally externally stock, other than it's got a slightly bigger exhaust, which is not all that obvious. Um, it's it's totally un you know nobody knows it's coming, <laughs> um, and it's not to sixty is probably in the fives in the five second mark. So it's it's quite fast, um, but it's not only you know, dangerous to do it in the wet to be frank because it, it slides all over the shop. But uh, in the dry, it's it's a bit of a weapon, and um, it, it's good fun. So it keeps it keeps Porsches honest. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> Uh, so it's it, yeah, good fun, good fun. So that's 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 one of my cars. I do, I, and I like old cars. It's not it's not a car I'd use every day because it's incredibly noisy and it's got no creature comforts in it at all. It has got a stereo, not that you can actually hear it, partly because of the exhaust and partly because of the supercharger. Um, so all those things are things for that. So as as you know, I like. <laughs> I do like mucking about with cars. Um, there we go. Um, right, so there's, there's no alternative here. We're, we're not triggering this mission, are we? Onwards we go. Um, um, and I must admit, I'm I'm in a I'm in a um, you know I, I suppose because I'm getting older. Um, I must admit, I'm, I've, I've, I've you know I've got in modern cars and. Um, they really leave me quite cold. Um, I don't like. I mean, my wife's car. She's. I mean, it's not all that new. It's almost ten years old, and that's a Passat um, Volkswagen thing, uh, and it's literally an estate car. We use it for lugging stuff about. And uh, but it's got you know when you st it, well you can't even start it without putting the clutch on the floor and pressing the brake pedal, and um, you know, then you can start the engine. <laughs> And before you pull off, it won't do certain things unless you put the seatbelts on. And then it doesn't have a handbrake, it has a button on the dashboard. And, you know, if you try and rev it, it, you know, automatically, unless you're in gear, it won't let you. It, 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 there's a computer which says no. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's an older car. And I've been in modern cars and I just, you, you, you get in them and it's just bing, 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 bing. You haven't done this, you haven't done that. Your phone's not syncing. <laughs> Your traction control system's on, um, and you know, before you drive away, make sure you click. <laughs> it's like driving a computer, it's awful, um, and I hate all that. <laughs> I do hate all that. Um, you know, um, all all of my cars start with a key. <laughs> it just seems to be something that nobody else does anymore. Um, so you know, I I don't like. Uh, you know, and touch screens everywhere, and these dashboards with with touch screen things. It, it, you know, some people love it, and if you love it, that's absolutely fine. I can't stand it. Um, and um, you know, I like the fact. You know, somebody says somebody somebody says you know under the bonnet. I love the fact under the bonnet of my cars, there's a throttle cable. If you tweak it, you can make the engine <laughs> engine rev without touching anything else. You know, that's. Um, and I understand how the cars work, and when they go wrong, which are, you know they're not unreliable, unreliable, but you know things happen. Um, you can fix them. You don't need to plug a computer in them to find out what's going wrong. <laughs> and the MX-5 is is brilliant in that sense because it literally is a Meccano set. Um, everything is either a 10 millimeter or a 13 millimeter socket bolt. Oh, and that's everything, absolutely everything. Um, so it's trivial. There's lots of space under the bonnet to fix things. And, um, it's, uh, thing. and, you know, I kind of, in my head, um, car design in some ways peaked in the 90s, I think, um, because you got rid of all the unreliability problems that plagued us in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, we still had some interesting car shapes that were, because, I mean, I know it, it's probably a criticism you can level at um, cars at any particular point, but they kind of all look the same nowadays. I, I have no idea what I'm following other than reading on the back, oh, it's a... Dacia something something, <laughs> or um, you know what's the other one? The Daihatsu this or you know it's a yeah you know, I don't even recognise some of the manufacturers anymore. Um, so um, let's buy the missiles. I, I like to travel with a full stack of missiles. Um, gives me comfort, even though I don't use them. <laughs> 
Uh, save. Onwards we go. So, yeah, I'm not sure we're. Right, where are we? We're there now. Let's go. Let's go there. It doesn't really matter where we go. We're just trying to rack up kills, aren't we? Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not. I'm just not a big fan. It's just. just Everything is, you know, the throttle isn't really a throttle, it's all electronic. And I know they're much better for the environment and all that kind of good stuff, but um, cars don't, I mean, the the newest car I've got is my Audi TT, which is a, um, that's also a Mark 1. There's a bit of a Mark 1 thing going on for most of my cars. Um, I like the original design. And um, it's... Um, that's my most modern car. That one actually you can plug into a computer and talk to it. Not not very much, but you can ask it things. Um, and I've sort of bought that because it's a it's a really good all weather car because of its four wheel drive system. And it's not actually it's not really a four wheel drive system, but that's that's another that's another whole discussion. Um, let's not get hit by a taken out by an alloy <laughs> but uh, it, it's very short-footed in the way and it's quite quick and I like quite quick I've, I sort of have a a general rule that I don't drive cars below 200 brake horsepower <laughs> just because I find them frustratingly slow but I do like older cars particularly the you know things with with, with less power than that that you know older cars I'll forget but modern cars no way um, um, yeah, <laughs> mopping out distributor caps in the pouring rain. Uh, you like reliability? I, I, yeah, reliability is good, but it doesn't. I don't. I don't like, see. The thing is, I've got a. You know, you've possibly been seeing me on Twitter and Facebook if you follow me there. Um, we've been restoring a Golf GTI from the 80s, um, partly for the nostalgia, and partly really because my son is an absolute car nut as well. Um, it's. Um, it's kind of his in, a part of his, his inheritance, really, because um, he can't afford to buy one at the moment because he's saving for a house and all the stuff that young people have to do. Um, and by the time he can afford to buy one, they'll be, they'll be they'll be ridiculously expensive because they're heading into collector's territory now. Um, they'll be double the price in a few years' time. Um, so it's kind of a bit of investment for him, but partly by the time he can afford to insure it himself, he won't be able to buy one. So I've sort of bought it now with the idea that he'll have it in a few years' time. Um, but we've been fixing it and putting it back on the road. So um, it's now sitting on my driveway under a cover, waiting to be um, taxed and insured for driving. Um, which, of course, because I'm an old man now, is, is, is very cheap, <laughs> relatively. Um, so, but we haven't driven it yet. We, yeah, and I, you know, I drove Golf GTIs and things back in the eighties, and nineties. Um, so I'm quite looking forward to how what what that what that's actually like because I, I imagine it's going to be slightly rose tinted view. Now, on one hand, you've got this Golf GTI sixteen valve, which of course was the top of the range car back in nineteen eighty eight. Um, you know, and it had an astonishing one hundred and thirty nine brake horsepower. <laughs> from a car that 1.8 um which back then was was pretty was pretty serious stuff of course now it's no more daunting than a you know a sandwich <laughs> um and it does not to 16 eight eight seconds i mean <laughs> there are diesel estates that can easily do not to 60 and less than that um so but you know by fast car standards it's it's um it's not anymore but you know in of itself it's still a hopefully um, it's still a fun car. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what it's actually like after 30 years of um, <laughs> time has gone past. Um, oh, so a 205 1.9. Yeah, now those those were actually better than the Golfs. If I'm I'm a bit of a Volkswagen Audi fan, but I will I will I will pay homage to the Peugeot 205 because it is the 205 is probably. I think in it certainly it's 1.9 form is probably the best hot hatch there ever was. I don't and I don't think nowadays it will ever be bettered. And I you know because a hot hatch to me um, is really an 80s phenomenon. It's it's a you know it, you took the average model in the range, um, you stuck stuck a bigger engine in it, some go faster stripes, lowered the suspension, put some bigger wheels on it. And some bit, you know, some slightly better brakes, and 
boom, hot hatch, okay? <laughs> it started getting very silly in the 90s because you start introducing four-wheel drive and you know bespoke this and cup versions and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you want, want that, that's not to me, that isn't what a hat, hot hatch is. Um, so I, I kind of do consider the 205 and probably the Mark II Golf, the one we've got, um, as the best hot hatches that ever there were. Um, and I don't think you can, you know, it, it, I mean, they, they, you can still buy a GTI and a you know, whatever today. And they're very, very fast and they're very, very good cars. No doubt about that. But they're not really in the spirit of the original cars because they're loaded down with traction control and, you know, air conditioning and <laughs> all the stuff that we expect on modern cars. Um, and, you know, this, that and the other. And, and then they're, they're just not raw enough to be as, as, as fun. So, um, so, yeah, so the 80s, maybe the early 90s is to me is is where the hot hatches really were, were a proper thing so there we go <laughs> so yes 205 thumbs up huge thumbs up i've never driven one i'd like to drive a um i'd like to drive a 1.9 gti never driven one um chased a couple <laughs> um but not not actually driven one so yeah, I should I should really do a stream, or, you know, cars of the eighties, shouldn't we? <laughs> um, oh yeah, Lotus Car. Now so there are some amazing cars from that generation because actually the eighties is where the uh, just I mean for those sorry for those of you who are a bit bored about car talk, but um, it's another one of those things from the eighties where things really took because in the seventies cars were rubbish. Okay, cars were utter utter rubbish in the seventies. Um, they were breaking down. They, they were British, well at least in in, in the UK. They were. Um, Cars were rubbish in the 70s. They were always breaking down. They were unreliable. They rusted. Um, okay, they were just. <laughs> oh, yeah, car. Do, 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 Sorry. <laughs> That's another 82. Can I play it? No. No. Something like that, anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, doo -doo 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 -doo. That was Gary Newman, wasn't it? Gary Newman. Yeah, yeah, there we go, Gary Newman. Uh, but yeah, so cars in the 70s were rubbish, okay? Cars in the 70s were generally rubbish. Um, in fact, probably about the only reliable car was, was a Beetle. Um, and then the Japanese came, okay? Then the Japanese came with things like the Toyota Corolla and Toyota this, that, and the other. Um, and Honda this and Honda, Honda that and they taught everybody in the 70s that you could make a reliable car okay they didn't look great you know they were derivative designs based on what the Japanese thought the Europeans wanted but they were reliable okay and that was a big deal in the 70s <laughs> you know here for the first time ever you could get in your car drive somewhere and be, and be able to get back home on the same day <laughs> that was unheard of in the 70s. Um, I remember my dad driving to places, you know, in things like Austin 1100s and, and, and minis and things like that. Um, um, and you would take tool, tool kits with you and you would expect, when you went away for the weekend, you'd spend, um, you know, Friday getting the car ready, <laughs> psyching it up for the trip. Go to wherever you would hope, hope you got there, didn't break down. But, you know, Saturday you'd spend it wherever you were. And then Sunday you'd be prepping the car. <laughs> to make sure it came home again. <laughs> and that was, that was just normal in the 70s. That's, that's how it was. Um, and then suddenly the Japanese came up with this, this amazing idea that maybe cars could be reliable and that you would just get in them and drive. I mean, it was, it was, you know, it was, it was Star Trek sort of stuff, you know. <laughs> what a crazy notion that is. Um, what a reliable car. Um, and so the Japanese came in and showed us this. And then, um, you know, the British basically said, you know, we're, we're not doing this. And we had all sorts of problems with our car industry, which was down to partly down to mismanagement and partly down to militant unions. And depending on which side of the political fence you sit on, one or other of those is true, OK? Um, but basically, the British car industry could never compete with this and effectively wiped itself out. Um, and now, hence, everything is either Japanese, German, or, uh, or, or kind of something else nowadays. Uh, and the Germans came in with things like the Golf, and that was reliable as well. Um, and so, um, you know, we had this idea suddenly that cars could be reliable and you could depend upon them. 
Um, so yeah, <laughs> so then in the eighties, um, then then it, then there was a bit of one-upmanship going on. Yeah, depending on what you had on your cars were um, probably in the eighties even more of a status symbol than they are now, um, because we have other things to status symbol about. I think in the um, uh, you know nowadays, whereas cars were a big big deal, partly because there was this thing, particularly in the UK, called the company car, um, and the company car basically was basically. <laughs> That your the company you worked for, if you got to a certain rank, i.e., you were a manager or slightly, you know, slightly higher up, the company would would buy you a car, and they would generally buy you a car better than what you, you'd normally be able to afford. So having a company car was quite a big deal, okay. And so you you would have cars given to you by the company. Oh, I've got a company car. Okay, well, everyone was like, ooh, so you're going up in the world, okay? Um, yeah, because you had a company car. You know, having a company car was like, ooh, yeah, he's doing all right. You know, he's on the, he's on the up. Um, so that was all kind of good stuff. So in the 80s, it then it all became about what company car you had, of course. And so manufacturers got into this sort of tit-for-tat performance um, spec race. And so what you'd see on the back is that you'd, your base car, your average car, would just have like a L or a G or something on the back. You know, so you'd have a Golf L, which was kind of the, it, it didn't stand for low, but it kind of meant low spec. Okay, so you'd have wind up windows, <laughs> four speed gearbox and things like that. Whereas if you were a company car, you'd probably have the, the GL. Okay, so the GL. <laughs> was the better one which might have electric windows and you know two door mirrors things like that and maybe a five speed gearbox um that was you know oh he's got the he's got the gl model so the the, the letters on the back of the car were really really important <laughs> and then then they yeah and some of the just put it in then the eye the eye became important okay oh and the gear badge so you had all these extra badges <laughs> so, so, then the eye came in so then it meant that meant you had a fuel injected car Okay, which was better. It, it didn't matter what it really meant. It just meant it was better. Okay, so if you had a fuel injected car, then it was better than the average car. Okay, so a GLI. Hmm. He's got the GLI model. You know, that's even better than the GL. And then the GTI came along, which was the sporty version. Okay. Then you had the GTI version with red stripes. Everything had to have red stripes and black trim in the eighties. Um, and so you'd have the <laughs> you'd have these cars. Oh, he's got the GTI. You know, that's even better. Um, and then it, <laughs> GLX, which was kind of better than the GL. <laughs> All these things. Okay. So if you look at any 80s cars, they at the beginning of the 80s, they just had a few letters. And by the end of the 80s, they had loads. <laughs> because it just got more and more complicated. And you could end up with things like the Ford XR3 or XR2i 16V <laughs> turbo. <laughs> <laughs> these things were stuck along the back of the car um, to make it better than the one that had gone before. GLXI. <laughs> so, so you start with an L, GL, GLX, GLXI, GTI, XXI. <laughs> there was even one, the Dohatsu something, called the GTTI, which was a GTI with a turbo. <laughs> and they all had big turbo signs down the side of the car <laughs> to make them look cool. That was cool in the 80s, okay. Lots of black trim. Um red stripes and 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 turbo monikers on the side of your car yeah, then you were then you were going places um and so every every couple of years or so there was a new thing that you had to get to to be cool and the top of the tree so the first one that came on was the i okay if you had an i on the back of your car it basically stood for i'm better <laughs> um so an i was really really important okay then it became 16 v so that meant you had a 16 valve engine which was a which was a big deal in the 80s okay so if you had a 16 valve engine you were better than everybody else who had the ordinary eight valve engine nobody knew what it meant some people said it was voltage which it wasn't <laughs> um yeah but 16 valves obviously is better than eight right so that's how it was done um and then the turbos came out then the four wheel drive and then then well, 1.8 obviously isn't enough so you need the 2.0 and then it became V6, so you had a V6 in it, it just kept going on, <laughs> on and on and on, into about the mid-90s when it all stopped. Um, and cars became a bit more boring again, but um, because they, they, you know, they all became really difficult to insure at that point in time, and uh, that, that was a problem. Um, right, so let's try one, <laughs> let's go through one more system, because it's getting completely, um, it would be ironic at this point if we actually trigger the mission. Uh, which way do we want to go? We're sort of a little bit in the dead end here. I think we want to go down. Let's go down to Sob Sobity. Um, 
let's go there. We'll, we'll stop in sober tea today. So yeah, so so cars went through this really kind of. Oh yeah, and then of course nowadays you still got VTEC, yo. <laughs> Is that from Mighty Car Mods? I love that show um, with the unicorns and the VTEC. Yeah, so you know, you still got all those sort of buzzwords. Just like that. Oh, this is it. This is it, guys. We've got it. This is the supernova mission. Whoa, how about that? Right at the end of the stream. Right, fuel leak. Okay, what, what do I do? Uh, <laughs> I think I've got to go to the space station. Um, Mayday, Coriolis in danger. Awesome, we triggered the mission. Yay! Right, Coriolis in danger. So we've got to get to the space station. Actually, I'm going to save. Let me save the game at this point. There we go. I've got a note on it. Right, so let's get to the space station. Uh, we have the mission. The sun has gone red. Um, uh, Coriolis in danger. Awesome. All right, so I've got to get to the Coriolis space station. So I presume I can dock with it. Yeah. There we are. Look at this. Docking computer's on. Right, so what happens? What happens? What do I do? <laughs> Um, aren't I supposed to be prompted to pick up some... Let's sell some slaves here. <laughs> what do I do? Am I supposed to... Okay, buy some fuel. I can't buy fuel. Okay. Uh, I've got the docking computers and there's no fuel here. So... Alright, there we go. The sun is going nova. So when I buy, try and buy some cargo... There we are. Um, when I try and buy some cargo... It comes up with this. The sun is going nova. Will you save us? Uh, what do you reckon, guys? <laughs> uh, yeah, all right then. Right. A large cargo bay full of refugees. Okay. Well, I might go back and play it a minute and find out what happens if I say no. <laughs> um, right. So, presumably, I can't buy fuel, which is interesting. Uh, so I've, it forces me into Galaxy 3 um, at this point. So I think what I've got to do is launch and press the Galactic Hyperspace Drive to get out of Dodge. Because I think if I don't, what happens is I die. So I think I've got to immediately press... There we go, look, there comes the sun. And I just make it out in time. Galactic Hyperspace. <sighs> we have triggered the first mission. How awesome is that? We did it, we did it. Right, let me get a save. Um, that was it, that was the mission. And we ha Actually, we haven't quite finished it yet, so let's save the, uh, we've got to save these refugees, right? We have a cargo hold full of refugees, which we've now got to transport, presumably, safely to a Coriolis space station. So let's do that, and let's get the end of the mission. Um, and next week, then, we might play, um, we might play around with that mission a little bit. I'm so glad that triggered right at the end there. Because, of course, the first time you see that, you hyperspace in and everything's gone red. You're kind of wondering, what on earth, uh, what on earth do you do? And you have a fuel leak. Oops. Oh, of course. <laughs> I can't go hold full of refugees. Um, oops. Let's get to the space station. I think we get, I think we just get given some money. Um, pretty sure that's what we get. Uh, but we'll, we'll find out when we get there. So, oh, almost there. So yeah, the star, the, yeah, the star growing there was, was very cool. It was indeed. I'm so glad that happened on the stream. Good way to end the stream, right? I couldn't have, I couldn't really have done that better, to be honest. <laughs> it's just I had no idea what it was going to trigger. It just decided to trigger then. So that was that was cool. Here, probably wondering what's this guy doing? Because uh, now I like to literally have a cargo bay full of refugees. Um, so yeah, it's pretty incredible they crammed those sort of missions in. Now this is the first of three missions, okay? 
Um, so there we go. We've, we've triggered the first mission. So that is that is very cool. Uh, let's get to the space station. And with a bit of luck, we'll get the S. Where's the S? There it is. Right, so we get to the space station. And... Um, I'm guessing we sell. You have saved our lives! <laughs> Thank you, Commander. <laughs> That's good. Um, it might have happened happened 20 minutes earlier, apart from the car talk. Sorry about that, yeah. <laughs> but hey, it's it's a sort of 80s nostalgia stream. What, what do we do now? Do we sort of... And they've given us 100 gemstones. Oh. That's nice. No, Bitstorm. So this is this is the Spectrum. I think it's a Spectrum only mission. The missions are different on all the different platforms. So on the BBC and the Commodore 64, I'm pretty sure we have the Constrictor mission, um, which is chasing a badass ship around the galaxy and eventually killing it. And then some Thargoid plans where you've got to smuggle some plans from one side of the galaxy to the other and the Thargoids interdict you all along the way. Those, I think, are the only missions on the BBC and the C64. Um... On the Spectrum, there are, we believe, and we're not sure, we believe there are three missions, they're different. So the first one is the one we've literally just triggered, which is the Supernova mission. So that's the one that we've just had. Um, the second mission on the Spectrum is hunting down an ASP with a cloaking device, which when you shoot it, it gives you a cloaking device. Awesome. Um, on, and then the third mission on the Spectrum, we believe, is a Thargoid-infested space station, um, which you have to go and destroy. Which is quite cool. Okay, sounds quite sounds quite cool. Anyway, um, so the supernova mission we believe is unique to the Spectrum and probably anything else that was using a Z80 CPU. The reason they were different is that the BBC and the Commodore 64 versions were well. The BBC version was written by David Braben and Ian Bell, obviously. The Commodore 64 version was a port done by David Braben and Ian Bell, so they didn't change it too much. Um, and um, the but the Spectrum version isn't a port it's a rewrite because the architecture of the computers are totally different by another company uh, Taurus in this case a, you know a year later in the BBC version so it is a different code base and apparently according to Ian Bell's website which is worth checking out it says on there that when the games were ported to different platforms the missions that the program has put in um, Ian Bell sort of said to them make up your own thing have fun see what you can come up with and so that's why the missions in all the different versions of the original elite are different um, so um, so yeah so they give us a hundred grams of gemstones which doesn't sound very much but if you look at the price list um, gemstones are 21 grams uh, 21 credits per gram so they've given us about what 2,000 credits so that's all right so let's sell that oh I can't even sell them all in one go won't let me there we go. There we go. We've actually that's, we've done all right. That's pretty good, isn't it? Um, so let's buy some fuel. We're now, of course, in uh, in Galaxy Three because we had to galactic charter. It's the only way to, it forces you into the next galaxy because you can't buy any fuel and you have a fuel leak on the way in. That's programmed into the game, so it forces you into Galaxy Three. Um, so, which is the stage for the, presumably the next mission. So we'll see. We, we, we're now forced into Galaxy 3. This is really good. So, um, so there we go. You have seen the first mission on the Spectrum, the Supernova mission. So I think that was pretty cool uh, for an 8-bit computer. It was quite exciting, wasn't it? <laughs> the sun exploding and very, very cool. I enjoyed that. That was good. So there we go. That's where we're going to end up today. We are still fugitive. We're now in chart 3. We've got 10,000 credits everything on board and the energy bomb and so on and so forth. So yeah, so there we go. Awesome stuff. I really enjoyed that. That was good. Thank you again ever so much for your company. Hope you hope you enjoyed that. Hopefully there'll be a, uh, somebody could clip that actually, um, that supernova bit. That would be really cool. Um, so that would be good. And uh, I might say, see if I can go back and take some screen grabs of that because obviously I managed to capture it on my stream as well. So um, so there we are. Number one mission. We have, we have, we have it for posterity. I'm going to clip that little bit also for YouTube and put it up separately as well as the mainstream. Because the objective of this for me was to capture the original missions um, and, and put them all together. So there we go. Mission number one has achieved. We have two more missions to go. So that's that's cool. 
awesome stuff. <laughs> and a bit of 80s nostalgia about cars as well. So there's always going to be some aspects of 80s nostalgia to the stream. That's just the way it is. So there we go. Thank you very much, my friends. Have yourself a very, very good weekend. Take care. And I will see you all. Actually, I won't see you on Monday. Monday is a bank holiday here in the UK. So I'm not going to be... Um, not going to be streaming that day. So back on Thursday for the Elite Dangerous Law Tour, which is going to be all about the Alliance. So stay tuned for that. Otherwise, take care of yourselves. Have a great one. Be good. And I will see you all soon.